I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have a variety of topics today. You know, everything from how, what's this tree to what's this bird to what's on my tree. You know, so we've got we've got a variety of topics today that everybody should enjoy listening to. Yeah, so as we were talking in the pre-show, you know, we got some heavy hitters for you all mm-hmm. today. We've got some great presenters. Um, we've got um, Laurie Thomas is going to be doing um, tree identification. You know, we got 120 native tree species mm-hmm. in Kentucky. Figuring out which is which is not an easy thing. And, you know, Laurie's been doing the Tree of the Week for us for several years now, and she's got a big thing, but she's going to help us be able to distinguish one tree from another, which is really an amazing skill. It's, instead of like giving somebody a fish, Renee, she's going right. to teach them how to fish. So teach them how to fish, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful thing. And then we have Dr. Ellen Crocker with us, and she's got another segment on what's bugging my tree, and I won't reveal that yet. We'll say that um, for Dr. Crocker. And then we have um, Dr. Um, DJ McNeil. He's going to be talking about some of the late summer birds that we might be seeing or seeing soon. So really excited about having our presenters on today, but most excited about having you all with us. Thank you for being with us. If you've got questions, you can use the chat function and interact with our presenters. Or if you're on YouTube Live, you can hit us up on email at forestry.extension at uky.edu and we can respond that way. But again, thank you all for being with us today. Renee, delighted to be with you as well. You too. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, Lori. We appreciate you being on. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, we're in August. We're starting to move into our fall. And I thought a good time, as you said, a good time to brush up on maybe some tree identification. We're going to start to see some fall colors. Um, but I'll go ahead and start this off. Let me uh, share my screen. And we're going to go kind of briefly over um, tree uh, basics of tree identification. Um, And as Billy said, in Kentucky, we are a really diverse forest. We have over 120 different kinds of trees here, so it can make identification a little tricky here in the state, but we're going to I'm going to introduce you to a guide that is a pocket guide, super easy to use, that might really help you um, start to learn, be able to learn your trees. So let's just kind of quickly talk about some of our tree characteristics. As you know, here in Kentucky, we have a lot of deciduous broadleaf trees. Um, Those are the ones that the the fall leaves are about to, we're going to see changing color and they're going to drop. But we do have some of our conifers as well. So we use our leaves to help us identify trees. And that's probably the best place to start in that's what we're going to focus on today, especially since we still have leaves on the trees. Twigs and buds are a great thing to use, especially in the winter months. Um, but as you really get more in tune with your tree, you're going to start looking at those twigs and buds. Flowers are great. And when we're looking at them in a seasonal aspect, that can help confirm. The same with the fruit can help confirm a tree. Bark is also can be a, a good identifier for specific species. But remember, bark is one of those things that as that tree grows, that bark may change um, its characteristics as that tree grows larger. Um, So sometimes bark can be a little tricky. With one exception here, I wanted to point out, this is a great one, American sycamore. Everyone knows it. It's that camouflage bark. It's that dark kind of brown down below, and it peels away to that nice white at the top. And you can identify this tree from 20 paces. You see it in a creek bottom, you know that white at the top that you've got an American sycamore. But today, like I said, we're going to focus on leaves. So when we are looking at leaves, I just wanted to point out, it's really important that we look at more than one leaf on a tree because leaves are not the same on a tree and of a species. As we see here, we have three examples of black oak. Um, We have a black oak here, nice broad leaf, still has the bristle tips. This one is not a broad leaf. It's got very deep um, indentations um, or sinuses. And this one almost looks like it's evergreen. So you want to make sure you look at several leaves on a tree. Um, And the same goes for our uh, conifer trees to our needle type trees. So when we are looking at trees, the first thing when you walk up to the first thing you notice about the leaves, and this is going to be the first question in this little tool that we're going to use, which is called the dichotomous key. The first thing you're going to notice is does this tree have needles or does it have leaves? And so we're Um, You can see here, we've got needle type trees, um, a broad cypress is an example of that. And then we have our broad leaf um, trees here, and which is what we mostly have in this state, our broad leaf trees, like our hickories and our oaks. We are kind of an oak hickory forest. So that's probably the first big characteristic you're gonna notice. And I wanted just to kind of veer off to conifers real quick because we do only have several in the state native to the state. So 
um, identifying conifers in a natural setting is a little easier than our broadleaf. Um, but conifers, our needles are kind of broken up into different categories. We have scale-like needles, as you can see in that scale, like they're little overlapping scales. Or we have single needles, so that's one needle that's attached to the stem. Or we have needles in groups or bundles. They can be in twos, threes, and fives. And so let's look at some actual examples here, real photographs. So our scale-like needles of trees we have in the state are eastern red cedar, which is our top one here. I mean, you can see those nice compressed scales there. And this new, um, the ones that look like they're standing out, and those are the ones that are kind of prickly when you hit it. That's the new growth, those. And, but we have the compressed needles or scales. And then you've got northern white cedar. Now, we don't find a lot of northern white cedar here, but we do have it. It's in a lot of times it's planted around cemeteries. But those have all nice, flat, compressed, scale-like leaves. And then we've got our individual leaves. So these are a single needle and we have our Eastern hemlock and you've got one needle attached to the, the twig. And then you've got the same with the, the, um, the bald cypress. Now with the bald cypress, I'll point out it, while it is a conifer, it is cone bearing, it is not evergreen. It does drop its needles in the fall, which it's getting ready to do and will grow all new needles in the spring. The rest of our conifers that we're looking at here are evergreen. And then there's eastern white pine, and this is a real common landscape tree, as is bald cypress too, but eastern white pine has long, soft needles in groups of five, and um, so that's an easy one to identify. It sometimes kind of actually has a bluish hue from a distance as well. And then we've got pitch pine. Now, this is one of our true like pines that we find in the woods. It's going to have needles in groups of three, and they're going to be about three inches long. And this is why you want to make sure you look at several sets of needles or leaves, because theirs are going to be in groups of three. But when you look at shortleaf pine, it can have needles in groups of twos and threes. So that's why you want to make sure you look at several, because other than that, these trees are going to be forest trees. They look pretty similar if you're looking at the bark and whatnot, but check those needles out. Short leaf two and three, pitch in, in groups of three. And then last, we have Virginia pine. It's going to have needles in groups of two, and you can actually see where they're grouped together. And it almost looks like they're in a little bit of an embrace. They get embraced, they get kind of twisted around. And those needles are going to be short, and these trees tend to be scrubby looking. So those are the native conifers or cone bearing trees, evergreen trees that we have here in the state. So once you get that down, those are pretty easy to identify. But when we get to broadleaf, all of the rest of those 120 are a broadleaf species. So some of the broadleaf characteristics that we look at are leaf arrangement, leaf form, leaf margin, leaf tips is what the tip of the leaf looks like and what the base of the leaf looks like. While we're looking at those, I wanted to also point out that looking at the buds is also very helpful. And it's gonna be helpful with helping us determine leaf arrangement and leaf form. So we've got, when we look at a twig here without any leaves, we have our terminal bud, which is the one at the end of the branch. And this is gonna be where all of that leaf, the stem elongation is gonna be. We've got new stems, fruits and leaves. And then we've got our lateral buds here. And you can see this is where last year's leaf was. That's called a leaf scar. And these are nice big leaves. This is on a black walnut, which has a great big leaf, so really easy leaf scar to see. But even if you didn't have leaves on this, you would be able to tell what that leaf arrangement is because you can see how those buds are arranged on that twig. One thing real quick about this, buds, buds are really helpful. Unfortunately, right as leaves um, emerge early in the spring, they haven't set bud yet. So it's a little trickier to do ID and referring back to the buds in early spring. But by late May, June, you're good to go. Then <clears throat> you want to look at, so we looked at the first thing was, do we have needles or broad leaves? The second thing we're looking at is leaf arrangement, how those leaves are arranged on a twig. So we have different arrangements. We have three different kinds. We have oppositely arranged leaves. You can see these guys are opposite from one another on that twig. And if you can remember the mnemonic Mad Buck, which stands for Maple, Ash, Dogwood, Buckeye, you can remember the groups of trees that have oppositely arranged leaves. So remember Mad Buck. And then most of the rest of our species are alternately arranged. And you can see how those leaves are, they are, they're staggered along that stem. So they're not across from each other, but alternately arranged. 
And then we do have wor a world species, which is our northern catalpa, and those leaves will be whirled around that stem. And northern catalpa is that species that has a real long, thin seed pod. We always call them cigar trees. Okay, so let's look at a few photos of a leaf arrangement. So we can see here alternate, we've got arrows too. You can see the bud, nice big bud on this American beach, how it is alternately arranged. The leaves are right below, attached below those buds. Those are also alternately arranged. And then we look over here at our oppositely arranged and we can see our buds are opposite as are our leaves. So this is gonna be a maple, ash, dogwood or buckeye. And in fact, it is a maple as you look at that leaf. Okay, the next thing we look at, so we've looked at what type of leaf, needle, broadleaf. Now we, we looked at leaf arrangement, alternate, opposite, or world. The next thing we're gonna look at is the leaf form. And we've got simple leaf form or we have compound leaf form. And to determine leaf form, this is where the buds are really important. So you come up to your tree, you look at it, and we'll look at this one that says simple. You're going to find that the bud, you see a bud right here on the twig, and you see a leaf blade, you see the leaf stem, and then one leaf blade. That is a simple leaf. So there's only one blade, a bud is at the base of that stem. Let's come over here to this palmately compound. So we're looking at what we think are the leaves, and we look at the base of those leaves, but we're not finding any buds. We move down this stem and we find that our bud is all the way down here. So we know that this is now a compound leaf and that these are called leaflets right here. So this palmately, so it's palmate like your hand, palmately compound leaf. And then we've got pinnately compound, no buds at the base of these leaflets. It's all the way down here at the bottom. So this is a pinnately like a feather compound leaf. A lot of our compound leaves are like this. Palmately, think of buckeyes. Pinnately, think of hickories, think of walnuts. And then bipinnately compound. This bud's going to be all the way down here. This whole giant thing is our leaf. And this is bipinnately or doubly pinnately compound. Think of coffee tree or honey locust. Those are two great examples. So we've looked at leaf form. So let's look at leaf form a picture. We've got a bud, we've got a stem, and we've got one blade. This is simple leaf form. We look here, we, we can see our buds are super easy to see right here. So we know that this is the leaf bud and that this blade has all of the leaflets. And this is a black walnut, very large leaf. So we have a nice big leaf bud. So this would be compound leaf form and pinnately compound leaf form. And then we're going to look at the margins. And this is just what the edge of the leaf looks like. So we'll have entire leaves. These have no indentations. They're smooth. There's no serrations, no lobing or anything on it. And these are two great examples with our eastern redbud or our, um, I think that's an umbrella magnolia. Then we have lobed leaves. So the lobes are the part that stick out. The indentations are called the sinuses. Our oak leaves have, lo most of our oaks have lobed leaves. Um, and the difference on these lobes is for oaks is to look at what's at the end of that lobe, which is the part that sticks out. Think of an earlobe. On red oaks, they have bristle tips. They'll be like a little hair tip in the tips of those lobes. And our white oaks have rounded lobes. So there won't be any bristle tips. And then we can have leaf margins that are serrated and think of it like a steak knife or a bread knife, depending on the serration. So those are little teeth all along the edge of that leaf. And then you can have leaves that are both lobed with this maple right here. We have one, two, three lobes with our pointed sinuses there, but we also have teeth all along the edge of that lobe. So it is lobed and serrated. Okay, so those are leaf margins, super quick, quick. Let's go over test time. Let's just see what we learned. Do we have a conifer or a broadleaf? Hopefully everybody's saying this is a conifer. We have needles. Are this opposite or alternate? This one's easy, it was our example. Those little buds are right across from each other as are the leaf stems. So we have an oppositely arranged. Are these alternate or opposite? Nice, staggered. We have an alternately arranged leaf here. Is this a simple or a compound? And I gave you one that you can actually see the sulfur yellow buds. This is a compound leaf. This is actually a bitternut hickory. So great if you got that one. Now let's look at leaf margin, lobed or entire. Well, we clearly see nice rounded lobes here. So we have a lobed leaf, a white oak. 
Um, and then is this statement true or false? Always got to have one of these. Is this leaf lobed, serrated, and compound? I see no lobes. I don't see serrations. And I see a bud down here with a small leaf stem and one blade, so it's not compound. This statement is false. All right, that's super quick kind of testing some of our knowledge. Now let's actually put it to use using a dichotomous key. So we kind of brushed up all characteristics. We're going to use what we learned to go through this dichotomous key. And a dichotomous key is just a tool that you can use in its logical sequence to help you identify something. Today we're using one with um, leaves. We use dichotomous keys for lots of organisms. This is just one for tree leaves. And a great one that I always recommend is the tree finder. It's a pocket finder. Um, it's been around since the 60s, fits in your pocket, costs about $5. It has a ruler on the back. It explains everything, every question it asks you. It, it explains what it means by alternate, opposite, compound, or simple. So let's just run through a quick dichotomous key. This is just a super abbreviated version. So this is kind of what one looks like if you haven't ever seen one. So you start at A or start here or one. The first question asks us, needles or leaves? Remember, that's the first thing we'll notice. Well, we would look at this and say this definitely has leaves. So now it tells us to go down to this group of statements or questions and it asks, are the leaves alternate? I'm sorry, are the leaves opposite or are the leaves alternate? Well, I've circled these for you so you can see it, but you can clearly see that these are alternately arranged leaves. Remember the um, leaf arrangements. The next one now was the second question. The third thing that we're going to look at is leaf form. So it tells us to go down to C and asks us if the leaves are simple or are the leaves compound. And I've circled where the little buds would be because it's kind of hard to see on the photograph. But we have a bud, we have a leaf stem, and we have one blade. So we have a simple leaf here. Now it tells us to go down to F and it gives us an answer that we have a, an, our sample here is a service berry. So that's really how a dichotomous key works. Really, and the one in the tree finder is, is almost as simple as this. So let's use the tree finder. I've actually taken photos of the, of the pages so you can kind of go along in case you obviously may, didn't know we were going to use it, wouldn't maybe have one with you. Um, but I will say the book is nice, pocket guide, about 70 different trees in the eastern half of the United States, and the summer one with the leaves also includes the uh, our conifers, which is great. If you get the winter tree finder for using twigs and buds, it does not include conifers. So <clears throat> we would start on page five. First question, does this sample, which I've taken a photo of, have needles or does it have leaves? Hopefully everyone's saying it has leaves. So now we're going to remember what this little symbol looks like. It's a little lollipop or that stylized tree. Take that over to page 14 and look for that symbol. That symbol. And it's the bracket at the top. We've got our symbol with a stylized tree on page 14. And so now it's asking us about leaf arrangement. And remember, that's the second, the second thing we're looking at. So it asks us if the leaves or buds grow opposite like this, and look, it even gives you a picture in case you don't remember, or if the leaves or buds grow alternately like this, um, and it tells us where we would go. So let's look at our sample right here. We can see buds and we see leaves, and these are oppositely arranged. I've even got it circled for us. So we have oppositely arranged leaves, so we already know we've got a maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye. So now we're going to take our oppositely arranged little um, figure, um, stick figure, and take and go to the down to the bracket below, which is where it leads us to. So now it's going to ask us about leaf form. If the leaves are compound, and look, it even tells you what it is. Are they composed of several leaflets? And it tells you how to tell if it's several leaflets. Or are the leaves simple, not composed of leaflets? Well, let's look. If we look a little closer, we've got a bud. We have a leaf stem and we have one blade, which I have all circled for you. So we know we have, with one blade, we have a simple leaf. So now we want to look at this little logo. It's got three different simple leaves on it. We're going to go over to page 18. So flip over to page 18. We look for that bracket that very in the very top bracket has that symbol on it. Now it's going to ask us something about 
lobes and maybe even the venation, or that's how those veins are arranged in that leaf. So the very top one, if the leaf has a single main vein with smaller side veins and is without teeth or lobes, we'd go to page 21. Or if the leaf has three to seven main veins radiating from one point and is lobed, it's a maple and we would go below. Well, we knew it was a maple ash dogwood or buckeye. So let's just look at our sample here. We see that we have three main veins and they are radiating from the very bottom of that leaf. So we know our answer is that maple. So we're going to go below. Now it's going to ask us about those notches or those sinuses, as I called them, that the space in between the lobes. Are the notches between the lobes V-shaped and very sharply V-shaped? That means nice pointed or are they U-shaped? And this is where it's important to make sure you look at several leaves because this one is like, it kind of looks more like my thumb. This one definitely looks like a thumb indentation. So definitely rounded and we're definitely rounded here. So we would have a U-shaped leaf notches or leaf sinuses. So now we're gonna take our symbol with the U-notched leaf sinus over to page 20. Look for that logo and it's the bottom one this time, the bottom bracket. Now it's gonna ask us a question about something you all can't answer because you don't have the sample, but being out in the field, you would. It asks if the leaf stem shows a milky juice when broken um, and the leaf, and then it asks us a little bit more. If the leaf is usually wider, then long and the base of the leaf is not curving. It's a Norway maple. Well, I can tell you when we break this, when I broke the sample, we do not have a milky sap. But even if you didn't know that, you can look at the rest of these statements and see if they're true or not. Well, we already know looking at the base of the leaf, it is curved. It's not flat. Um, and if we look at the size of this leaf, it's about as tall as it is wide. So it doesn't fit any, it does not fit the criteria for a Norway maple. Instead, it, there is no juice and the leaf is about as long as it is, it is wide and the base of the leaf curves. So we have a sugar maple. So we just quickly look at our sugar maple. Beautiful tree, um, great fall colors, and a really wonderful tree that we um, we have in Kentucky. Um, we tap it for maple syrup, and um, some of you all may have gotten involved in tapping with that. Wonderful maple syrup. It's also a terrific wood. It's a what we call rock maple or hard maple. We use it. It's a very sturdy maple, and we use it in a lot of things that gets a lot of high impact, like basketball courts, bowling alleys, and they're even using it um, as, as some alternatives for base ball bats um, with what we've seen happening with our ash trees, which ash, white ash is typically what our wooden baseball bats are made out of. But as you can see, that pretty short steps to go through. This is a great example. Some of them are a little bit longer, but just to kind of get you started using one of these, I hope you do all get the opportunity to maybe grab one and pick up one of these um, guides and, and put it to use, especially while we still have leaves on out there. Um, a few other resources that you may find handy are iNaturalist. Probably many of you all have this on your phone. It's a free download. You simply take a picture of the organism that you're trying to identify, and it's going to pop up, populate for you maybe 10 things to choose from. Um, and you're going to have to kind of look and say, yes, I think this is my, um, my uh, organism or my tree, and by looking at some additional pictures that it'll share for you. So it's not a dichotomous key. Virginia Tech um, Tree ID does have a dichotomous key. This one's very um, robust and it can be a little overwhelming at first. That's why I think it's great to start with the tree finder, 70 species versus 400 species. But Virginia Tech also has a great website with lots of tree fact sheets on it as well. Arbor Day tree identification, it's a dichotomous key, bigger than a pocket guide and more expensive, um, but it is nice. It's got a lot of great, great colored um, line drawings and stuff in there. And then if you want to, you don't remember some of this and you just really want little snippets at our UK Forestry Natural Resources site, we have our tree ID videos where we talk about all these different characteristics in short snippets of videos, especially if you want to share these with students. These could be a great resource for you. 
Um, and then you can also go to our UK Forestry Natural Resources Extension YouTube channel and check out the trees of the week that we've done so far. While these will have far more than just the identification, the identification is also included as are a bunch of fun facts about that tree um, for you to, to learn more about maybe the trees that are out in your yard or in your neighborhood as well. And then lastly, our Department of um, Horticulture has about 70 or 80 um, tree fact sheets up. So if you want just some print off a quick PDF about a tree that maybe is in your yard, you can do that at the um, UK Horticulture, Horticulture, Horticulture Native Trees of Kentucky. Awesome. Well, happy, good luck identifying trees. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, and do if you do get the opportunity to, to get pick up one of those tree guides, I highly recommend it. It's great to use with youth. I use this with about fourth grade on. Um, but yeah, a great, a great inexpensive resource. Well, nice. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, sure. I know anybody who's ever ID a tree needs to have this refresher, even if they know how to do it. It's still a lot of good information for anybody out there who wants to know their trees. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yes. And then we, had, we did have a question. Um, someone asked that for trees with iNaturalist, should you take a picture of the leaves and bark or what else should you take? So Ellen had said that she believes, um, Dr. Crocker, that it's based on, I've always done a couple of pictures just to see if I get different things. Bark would probably be a hard one, but um, she said that th she thinks the ID of iNaturalist does, is only based on that first photo you submit, and that's probably correct. If you sent several, it's going to focus in on that first one. So I would probably start definitely with the leaves. Um, that's the, and get a good, you want to get a good photograph of that leaf. Um, and especially if it looks like it's a compound leaf, include maybe some of the branching with it. The same goes, if you all are out and you find a tree or you're in an extension office and you've had somebody um, said, I have this tree, I don't know what it is, and you need assistance identifying that, please reach out to us. Photographs would, don't bring in, don't send in samples because they get dried up, but a photograph and get several, have the landowner or yourself get several photographs, the bark, kind of step back, get what the tree looks like, the form, get several of the leaves and that branching pattern because that helps us sometimes if it's just a leaf, it's kind of hard to tell. So, but we're always happy to help identify too. Yeah, it's always an adventure um, with some of those pictures we get. So, um, yeah, we appreciate those. Laurie, thank you so much. Sure. That's a great presentation. And I think you probably owe everybody an apology because now they may have the tree ID bug, right? And once you right. get it, it's hard <laughs> to get rid of it. It's like it gets in your ear and just you just can't get rid of it. No, uh -huh. uh, I mean, but once you start understanding the, the differences between the trees, it just really, it, really, it does. Problem. It makes it a big, I mean, we see the trees out there, but when you start knowing them, oh, there's a different level of appreciation. I mean, we appreciate them. But now we we have yeah it's great and I was I was going to say when we hear from Dr McNeil with the birds it's the same thing once you start looking at them more closely learning to identify it's the same thing you'll catch that bug too yeah that's awesome good stuff really keep it up keep up the great work all, right. all you work on our tree with the week um segments too Excellent. all right good take stuff. care Thanks so much bye all right so now that we've learned about trees, now we're going to find out what's bugging my trees. <laughs> oh, no. You know, and Dr. Crocker does such a wonderful job she for does. us. Um, and it's not that she's always doom and gloom because she's not at all. She's no. really one of the happiest, most cheerful people I know. But she does such an important job in keeping up with what's going on here in Kentucky and mm -hmm. kind of reporting and letting us know. And Dr. Crocker, thank you and your lab for all the work that you all do trying to keep our um, the forest healthy and, and productive here. Exactly. Well, thanks for having me on today. And I'm going to talk about an issue that's popping up right now. You might notice this in your trees. You might notice oak trees turning kind of brownish. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing a lot of bacterial leaf scorch in the bluegrass. And that is a disease that's going to get progressively worse each year. But there are some lookalikes and some other things that you might confuse it with. So um, I've got a short uh, video presentation for you, and then we can talk some more about it. Sounds good. I'm good. Go to it. Are your oak trees turning brown in late summer with leaves scorched from the outside margins in? It could be bacterial leaf scorch, a disease common in the bluegrass that can cause dead leaves, die back, and tree death over time. In this edition of What's Bugging My Tree, we'll talk a little bit about bacterial leaf scorch, what it is, potential lookalikes, and what it means for your tree. What is bacterial leaf scorch? 
It's a disease caused by the bacterium Xylella fastidiosa. It gets in the vascular system of the tree and impacts water flow. Specifically, the bacterium grows in the tree's xylem, the tissues responsible for moving water up through the tree. The bacterium prevents water flow, effectively strangling the tree from the inside. Symptoms are what you might expect for a tree under severe water stress. And you'll see similar symptoms regardless of the cause, as long as water is stressed. So lots of different things can result in similar bacterial leaf scorch symptoms on leaves. It's vectored by small insects that suck the sap from trees, um, things like leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, and spittle bugs. Unfortunately, not something you can really control. While most often you see symptoms on pin oak and red oak, many other tree species can be affected. Um, here we've got a picture of a pecan, but a really wide range of things from things like ginkgo to sweet gum to maples, elms, sycamores, and more. In fact, the bacteria that causes bacterial leaf scorch causes other diseases on hundreds of other plant species, including some agriculturally important ones, such as Pierce's disease of grape. What does bacterial leaf scorch look like? You will first see these symptoms in the late summer and they will get worse in the fall. The tree may leaf out normally in the spring and look totally healthy through the summer, and then leaf browning can come on suddenly, typically coinciding with hot, dry weather. This leaf browning tends to have a distinctive form, being scorched from the outside edges in, but this can look slightly different on each host plant. Here you see the characteristic symptoms on a red oak, but if you look at other species, these might look slightly different. Sometimes it has more of an intravenal scorching pattern. Sometimes there's more of a yellow halo or band between the dead and the healthy tissues. Leaves with uh, trees with these symptoms might hold on to their dead leaves or they might drop them early. Typically, one or a few branches will be affected initially, and this may increase over time with progressive decline of the tree. While the rapid onset of symptoms can make it look like bacterial leaf scorch happens suddenly, it's something that gradually gets worse each year. Instead of killing the tree rapidly, each year you might see more and more decline, more and more dead branches, until the tree eventually dies. Now, there are a lot of lookalikes to bacterial leaf scorch, and that's because the general symptom of leaf, scor leaf scorch, leaves with those scorch edges moving from the outside margins in, can be caused by many different things. For example, you can see winter leaf scorch on evergreens like holly when conditions are particularly cold and dry in the winter. On the other end of the spectrum, you might see similar dead leaf patterns when trees experience severe drought or heat stress. Since scorch is a symptom of insufficient water flow in trees, you might also see similar scorch caused by any kind of sudden issues that impact the flow of water. There are also many other pathogens that can cause vascular problems and result in similar symptoms. For example, other vascular diseases like oak wilt, Dutch elm disease, and verticillium wilt can look quite similar and result in sudden browning in a tree's canopy. However, these pathogens tend to quickly kill trees, while bacterial leaf scorch results in increasing stress and decline each year and not a sudden tree death, although sometimes it can sure seem like that. Because there are many different things that can look similar, a laboratory diagnostic test is needed to conclusively determine if what you're seeing is bacterial leaf scorch or something else. And that's important for knowing how to manage it going forward. So from a management perspective, unfortunately, there is no cure for bacterial leaf scorch. Trees that are infected will continue to decline little by little over time until they are killed. And you might see this in kind of tree decline that gets progressively worse over time with many other compounding factors. But you can greatly extend the life of trees by promoting their health. And you can reduce the likelihood of infection of a tree by keeping it healthy. 
Things like watering, especially during a drought, can help your tree. Also, because those branches will die over time, make sure to monitor trees and prune landscape trees as needed to avoid any risk. Um, in addition, you, things like mulching can be really beneficial for promoting the health of your tree and helping it defend itself against bacterial leaf scorch as well as other problems. There are some antibiotic injections that can be done by arborists to combat bacterial leaf scorch. However, these do not cure the infection so much as ideally push it back some and will need to be repeated regularly. If you have a lot of bacterial leaf scorch in your area, it could be worth planting trees not known to be as susceptible to it in the future. Avoid planting highly susceptible species like pin oaks and red oaks, and do what you can to promote the health of those trees overall so that they're less likely to get bacterial leaf scorch. Thanks for joining me today and learning a little bit about bacterial leaf scorch. If you want to learn more, make sure to check us out online and follow us on social media. Great. And I just want to emphasize that I mentioned a diagnostic test is needed to confirm bacterial leaf scorch because there are a lot of lookalikes. Um, so if you have something in your oaks and you're wondering, huh, my leaves aren't looking right, um, you know, it could be bacterial leaf scorch, but it could be many other things. Mm -hmm. And in order to determine that, uh, you'd want to do a diagnostic test. You can work with your county extension office to submit samples for that. There was a question. And this, yeah. this time of year, it's been hot, it's been dry. Yeah. I see a lot of death of those new shoots on trees. Um, that's not bacterial leaf scorch. Mm -hmm. That's going to probably be that new tissue getting fried by this hot weather. Um, things that you can do to assist your tree. Uh, we say to water trees during a drought and like Right now is a really good time to water your landscape trees if you've got them. It's not that we've been in a drought, it's just that this week is so hot. Um, and trees like to be watered deeply, but not frequently. So you want to give them a really deep, thorough watering, um, maybe once this week when it's gonna be so hot and also dry. So does that, um, no matter how old the tree is, or is that just for younger trees you would need to do Especially that? Especially for younger trees, definitely. If this is a newly planted tree, now is the time. Get out there and water that tree, um, you know, uh, again, deeply, but not something you want to give it a little sprinkle every day. Uh, you don't want those roots to constantly be wet, but you want them to have enough moisture. And the reason for those newly planted trees needing extra water is in that planting process, uh, they lose a lot of their root system. Uh, so they don't have as much capacity to take up more water uh, that they need from the soil. Um, so I'd say definitely for your newly planted trees, but um, when you're in a drought or we're experiencing a heat wave, um, any of your trees will benefit from that. We did have a question in the chat pod. Um, leaves at top of young white oak are curling um, on the edge like aphids, but no aphids are present. Do they? Do you think that could be leaf scorch? You know, it's really hard for me to say. Um, just based on the weather we've been having, my first thought would not be leaf scorch. It would be the weather. But at the same time, you know, I can't really tell that. Uh, without more information. And so if people have trees that they're concerned about, I really encourage them to work with their county office to, to bring a sample in and they can submit it to the diagnostic lab if that's necessary. Um, in addition, I just want to uh, recognize the wonderful resource that people have in Arborists. Um, these are paid professionals that can work with you not only to identify your tree issues, but to actually improve them. And if you're unfamiliar with arborists or unsure kind of what they are, what they do and who to go to, I encourage you to check out the website of the International Society of Arboriculture or ISA. They've got a lot of great resources as well as a list of arborists in your area that have their kind of certification. All right. Lots of great information, Dr. Crocker. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you, really. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, thanks for having me on today and hope no one is seeing bacterial leaf scorch. Hopefully all of your trees are looking great. Hopefully. But if you start to see this as the kind of fall picks up, um, now you'll have some ideas about it. Definitely.
look forward to having you on again real soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. All right. Moving on. Keeping it rolling a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we um, have Dr. DJ McNeil. He will be um, presenting a video for us because he can't be here today. Yeah, he's actually, I think, teaching class. Teaching class, right now, exactly. So um, we do appreciate Dr. McNeil putting this together for us. So he's going to be talking about late summer bird observations. Um, always a joy to have Dr. McNeil with us. Um, and Renee, I'll go ahead and get that geared up. That'll be great. Hey, I'm very excited for another of our Bird of the Month installments. Uh, we've, we've talked on Bird of the Month before about some of the birds that we're seeing in spring and summer and even uh, during the non-breeding season. Well, now it's, it's late August here in Eastern Kentucky, or I guess it's late August uh, just about everywhere right now. Uh, <clears throat> but here in Eastern Kentucky, we're starting to see some, some different patterns from our birds, and uh, we're going to dive into what a few of those are, just, just a, a couple that you might see in your backyard and in your woods and and uh, what you might see and what they might mean. So we'll dive right into it, to some late summer bird observations that you might see. So for most of our uh, bird species, this time of year is one in which we're seeing the end of the breeding cycle for many species. So here we've got some mallards. Uh, these are birds that have finished their breeding. Uh, they might have young with them or they, they may themselves be uh, in uh, the at the end of breeding condition finishing up so uh, let's see I think I've got a yeah laser pointer so this is a male mallard uh, he's he's transitioning from that breeding season color he's got that green head and that bright uh, chestnut breast into this sort of drab almost female like color this is a male as well here as is this one in the back this is a female uh, you can you can tell the non-breeding male from the female mallard the, the easiest way is by looking at the bill so the male mallard has this kind of like a sort of yellowish bill with no modeling on it. And the female has this orange bill with a, like a mottled saddle. But anyway, these birds have finished up all their breeding activity for the year or are in the process of finishing that up. Um, you know, you, you see this with songbirds too. So these are barn swallows here on, the, on their nests. So these are nestlings, but they're soon to be fledglings. Um, so these are old birds, they're still being cared for by their parents, but they're, they're able to fly, they're able to probably do a little bit of foraging for themselves. We're getting toward the end of the breeding cycle for a lot of these birds. So you're seeing a lot of this kind of thing. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of are juveniles. So we've talked about this on Bird of the Month before. This is a, a juvenile American robin. So we've got that sort of rusty colored breast and flanks that we're used to on a robin. But we've got wing bars, we've got weird spots all over the breast and the back, and the face kind of looks funny. So you've got a lot of this juvenile uh, appearance, or sometimes fledglings that are still dependent on their parents. Here's a juvenile northern cardinal. It looks very similar to the female, but we've got this like very dark bill. The adult female cardinal has a bright red or a bright orange bill, really. So uh, we've got a lot of these weird birds. Here's a red-bellied woodpecker, a nice adult male, and then we've got this goofy little fledgling, doesn't have any red on him at all, uh, or her, um, begging for food from dad here. So you see a lot of that kind of thing. The other thing you see is just birds that just look rough. So this is a, this is a juvenile Carolina wren here. You can see its feathers just look real nasty. It's, it's got, you can tell it's a, a juvenile, it's still got a little bit of a pale, uh, they, they call this area the gape, this sort of area where the, the opening of the mouth is. Um, and a lot of juvenile birds have like a pale gape. You can see just just looks rough. He's got that, that fledgling uh, plumage, that juvenile plumage that is very um, low quality. So we see a lot of that time of year. Now, <clears throat> this is the breeding cycle of the American robin here, and, and I'm showing you this uh, for a reason. I know it says American goldfinch at the top here, but bear with me. Now, now, this figure is really confusing, so let me get rid of some of the noise. Um, <clears throat> we're going to focus on these two sort of lines. You can kind of think of them as the same. This is the day of the year or the month of the year rather, so January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And these lines correlate or correspond to when the robin is going to have eggs and when it's gonna have young. So you can see American robin, which is a migratory bird, 
uh, starts their reproduction in April. We usually just have eggs in the beginning of April and toward the end of April we're getting young and that goes through May, June, July, and through August. So we're seeing the last of our birds that are still uh, uh, being raised for the year. Well, one bird that I often think of in terms of late summer is the American goldfinch. And the reason I think of the American goldfinch, so this is the same figure. Uh, these, are, these are birds of North America figures, by the way, or birds of the world, as it's called now. Um, and same figure for the goldfinch, so let's kind of get rid of the non-breeding and migration and so forth and look at the, the reproductive period for the American goldfinch. Absolutely incredible. So April, when all of our robins are breeding, absolutely no breeding. May, very unlikely. Even June, really, there's not that much breeding activity for American goldfinch. Really unusual in terms of our birds. The, the robin is, a, is pretty typical in that case, but the goldfinch is a very late breeder. So that's one of the reasons why I think of American goldfinches of late summer. So beyond that, the American goldfinch, the, if you feed birds in your yard at all, you know they love thistle seed. So here's a, an American goldfinch feeding on thistle seed. And <clears throat> it, it's a really interesting life history. Here's the female American goldfinch. She's in the breeding season. She's relatively brightly colored, although I mean the back and some of the flanks kind of this greenish color. Yellow overall though, these, these dark gray wings with white wing bars and white edges on the primaries and secondaries. And this sort of uh, orangey beak with a dark tip. That's typical of the adult female. And the adult male has got that bright flashy coloration to him. He's got very bright yellow bold black wings with white markings and that black forehead. Only the male has the black forehead. So these are our breeding American goldfinch. They produce a ton of vocalizations. Probably a couple of the best known are the, uh, the potato chip called the potato chip or perchicory. I, I learned it as potato chip. They also do a, a nasally baby call. And the male, when he gets really excited and does his song, it's this really complex series of notes where they often mix in the baby and the perchicory potato chip call all jumbled together. So these are your adult American goldfinches that you see around. But really the thing that I hear the most juvenile and fledgling American goldfinches. You can see they kind of have the color palette of the female but with a lot less yellow. Very drab and they have a dark bill unlike the adults that have the orange and the dark tip. Well, they are just very noisy. So what you see here on the left is a mother American goldfinch being bombarded by three of her little fledglings. And both fledglings and juveniles produce this chickpea call. And they produce it constantly. It's one of the, the sounds of the end of summer in terms of birds in my mind. So here's that chickpea call. So listen for the American goldfinch, the adults, and the uh, juveniles this time of year. So beyond that, many birds, the American goldfinch included, are going into their pre-basic molt, or their, you can think of this as their non-breeding molt. So this is the molt that they do in spring that I'm showing here. Well, think of that in reverse as the pre-basic molt. So this is the really beautiful summer breeding male goldfinch on the right. Well, they're actually finishing up their breeding in, at the end of August and September, and they're transitioning back to this drab color. So the male loses his black forehead, he loses most of his yellow, um, he keeps the black and white contrasting colors on his wings, so you can actually still tell the male and female apart, and he keeps some of that yellow on the, on the front of his shoulder, but he keeps that kind of hidden there. So um, a lot of birds are undergoing this, this non-breeding, or it's the fancy term is the pre-basic molt. <clears throat> now this is not just restricted to goldfinches, of course, all birds essentially are undergoing 
And one thing that startles people is you see cardinals like this that have almost no feathers on their head, and I won't lie, it's a pretty uh, unattractive look for an otherwise beautiful bird. Um, and it's not only cardinals you see doing this, you get blue jays that'll undergo this really awful molt. Um, and you'll think I'm making this up, it sounds ridiculous, but the term for this is a catastrophic molt. <laughs> and the catastrophic molt is really common in blue jays and cardinals, especially this time of year. But don't worry, it only lasts a few days or maybe a couple weeks at most. So here's a blue jay on the left, and eventually those feathers start to, to grow in. He's not looking a whole lot better there. All right, here, you, you know, give him some time. He's starting to grow in those feathers and a little bit more time, and eventually he'll look as good as new or better than new. Now, the other thing that you're seeing a lot this time of year is pre-migration fat storage. So here's a kind of a cartoon skeleton. I think this is supposed to be a, a pigeon. Um, and the reason I have this on here is it's helpful to know where birds are storing a lot of their fat. So if you're a dove hunter or you're hunting any kind of bird and get the chance to look at a bird up close, the areas you're looking for fat are here in the furculum, the wishbone area, and then uh, this, so this is the rib cage, and then this is the, the pelvis here, so all the bird's organs are kind of in this sort of cavity. So birds also store a lot of fat uh, here kind of along the abdomen. So those are two big areas where you see it. And I'm going to show you next a picture of a bird that's, that's you can't really see its head very well, but it's, it's flipped up uh, with its belly kind of pointed toward the camera and someone is blowing air onto its, onto its abdomen and its breast and you can see the subcutaneous fat. So here's the breast uh, bone and then breast muscle, these reddish color, and then these kind of yellowy tan areas. These are fat. Uh, this is in the furculum and the wishbone, and then this is the abdomen. So here's a crudely drawn head and tail to kind of imagine how this bird is laid out. Its head is kind of hidden, like its its head is up there. You can't really see it. So, um, but yeah, you can see that the the bird's translucent skin. You can see where these birds are are storing fat. So this time of year, a lot of birds, your goldfinches and cardinals and all your little warblers and wrens, these little guys are, are, are consuming as much food as they can to store up some fat for migration. Another thing you see a lot of are, are flocking behaviors. So here's a flock of grackles. I just noticed there's a European starling hiding out in the back. They're not actually blackbirds, but they, they tend to hang out with blackbirds even though they're not native. Uh, here's a flock of red-winged blackbirds. They're forming a, a, a this looks like mostly red-winged blackbirds. And here's a mixed species flock. Uh, looks like red-winged blackbirds. There's some starlings in there. I think you could probably find a cowbird or two if you looked hard enough. Uh, but you see these big mixed species flocks, grackles and, car, uh, and uh, starlings and all these birds. And the last thing that we start to see in, in August uh, of note is actual migration. A lot of birds are beginning their migration. Uh, today here on campus, I saw a yellow warbler uh, looking very similar to the one on the left, getting ready for its southward migration. And, and of course, all of our birds are getting ready, at least all of our migratory birds are gearing up to migrate sooner rather than later. Um, I have this bird here on the left. It's not much to look at, and they don't breed here, uh, but they do travel through Kentucky, and this is called the Swainson's Thrush. And the reason I bring attention to the Swainson's Thrush, it's a really fun one to hear. So these birds are migrating at night in the dark, and if you go out really early in the morning, like just before sunrise, it's still kind of dark, you can, hear, you can hear a ton of these birds starting to migrate if you just listen you'll hear the little birds calling up in the sky. But, but one that you hear a lot because they're really abundant in fall and they make a lot of noise is the Swainson's thrush. If you're familiar with the frog called a spring peeper that makes that peep call early in spring, well, the, the Swainson's thrush does a very similar peep uh, at nighttime in the fall. So go out in the early morning uh, or even after dark, you know, just after sunset and listen for this, this peep call that the Swainson's thrush produces. Well, anyway, I think that's all I have for you for today. Uh, looking forward to next month's Bird of the Month. And in the meantime, uh, happy bird. That is always interesting. I really enjoy his segments. You know, it's funny because I rarely have seen a yellow goldfinch 
And I have seen a lot of them this year. And it seems like every time I see them, they're like upside down on a flower. And it's just so neat to see <laughs> their acrobatic kind of skills, you know. Um, but it's, it's really neat to to for him to explain some things like I would have never thought about. I mean, I know they store up fat for winter, but I never would think you could actually see that. Yeah, you know, no, that no, was, no. yeah it was really interesting. No, so uh, yeah. we appreciate him doing that for yes, us. Yes. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Appreciate the segment for sure. It's good stuff. And, you know, we had a lot of good content today. We, we, learned, we learned the process of tree identification, which is really important. We learned about something we got to keep an eye out for in this bacterial leaf scourge for sure. And then we learned about some of the birds we might be seeing now or here in the near future. So appreciate all of our presenters. But thank you all for being with us today. We certainly appreciate having you all with us. If you know of other people who might appreciate this type of content, please spread the word. Let them know about us. Um, we're here every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, and we'd love to um, have your friends and family with us, too. Yeah, we do. And, you know, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and see any show that we've ever ran since we started in 2020. Um, and we have a, a variety of content up there. So go ahead and check it out on that website. Um, and you can also uh, share a story idea that you might want to see on one of our shows. And you know what? We just might run it. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So let us know what you want to see and we'll try to get somebody to cover it for us. Definitely. All right. Until then, we will see you next week. So you all take care. Bye, Bye. From the woods today.